will be L.A. Marzulli, Bible prophecy expert, movie maker, prolific author. We're going to get to him in just a second. One story left over from last hour that I thought, well, maybe I should just skip it, but this one is too good not to to carry over and just give you this real quick. Uh, an Illinois woman this last week who's been accused of pretending that both she and her son have cancer in order to scam people out of money was reportedly on her way to film an interview for the Dr. Phil show when she was arrested in Chicago. (laughs) Poetic justice, right? I mean, uh, unbelievable. I mean, there are lots of scams out there, and, of course, they're all terrible, but faking you have cancer. I'm not sure that it gets any worse than that. All right, he's been with us many times before. The most interesting guy I've ever interviewed. It's just, I don't know what else to say. His name is L.A. Marzulli. Good to have you with us, L.A. Hey, great to be here. Thanks, Jim. Hey, you remember that little video that I had you on a couple of yeah. years ago? Yes, yes. That is, yeah, 615,000 views as of today. <laughs> wow, yeah. I'm counting. Yeah, that's going crazy. Now, let me give people your website right up front. It's lamarzuli.wordpress.com. And make sure you have his name spelled right. It's M-A-R-Z like in zebra, U-L-L-I. That's lamarzuli.wordpress.com. Because I know you're going to want to go there later, folks, and read what he's got. He's got so much going on. There's a new book. There's a new video. There's tons of stuff, and we're only going to be able to scratch the surface. L.A., I've got to get your comment on a couple of news stories before we get into all of the all of the stuff that you sent me. So, uh, tell me if I'm if I'm a good L.A. Marzulli student when I'm piecing together the following two or three things. We have an earthquake in Northern California, 6.0 in the Napa Valley. Then we have this story. The drought is so bad that California's mountains grew in a half inch, according to experts. And then we have a story this week. More than a half mile long crack is Mm -hmm. found in Mexico that scientists cannot explain. Uh, is, Is any of this connected? Absolutely. In fact, that was the the Sunday morning blog this morning, which may have been the shortest blog post um, I've ever written. I just basically quoted uh, Jesus' words from from um, uh, Luke Luke 21, where let me just pull it up here, where he's talking. You know, they're asking him, "What will be the signs of, of your coming? What's the signs of the end of the age?" And here he says, "See that you not be deceived. For many will come in my name, saying, I am He. The time has come. Do not follow them." When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. Such such things must happen first, but it will not immediately be the end. And he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be powerful earthquakes, famines, plagues from place to place, awesome sights and mighty signs will come from the sky. Hello? And all I did, all I did was just, I, I listed like, USGS, 6.0 earthquake, Chase, California, Bay Area. Iceland lowers aviation alert uh, from red to orange but the, with the Barabunga in Iceland, which is a super volcano. And if that thing blows, it, it, it could be a game changer. Um, exclusive video, anti-Israeli protesters defend Hitler. Um, underestimated Ebola outbreak spreads widespread panic. Cold summer, U.S. daily record minimum, uh, minimum outnumbering record maximums three to one in the last 30 days. NATO seems alarming buildup of Russian forces near Ukraine. Five false messiahs and why they're claiming to be Christ contradict the Bible. UFOs are being seen all over the world. And all I wrote was, I have been accused more than once of interpreting news articles as signs that we are in the end times. This is called eisegesis in theological terms. Then I explain what eisegesis is. Well, exegesis is the process of drawing out the meaning from a text in accordance with the context and discoverable meaning of its author. Eisegesis occurs when a reader imposes his or her interpretation into or onto the text. And this is the shortest post I've ever written. I will leave it up to you to decide where we are in terms of end-time prophecies, based on the stories I posted today. This may be the shortest post in the history of this blog. Raise it to locator, the thing speaks for itself. I, you know, Jesus warns us what to look for. He lists them specifically, and, and here we are. Uh, you tell me. I mean, it's just... You know, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, I, I don't know how people can ignore all of this that's happening. It's like right there, and the, you can take the newspaper and set it next to your Bible, and it's it's just it gives you chills. Now, the other, this other news story I wanted to get your comment on. I don't know if you saw this, but apparently American and British intelligence officials have used 
some kind of technology, a voice print technology. Uh-huh. And this was reported by Fox News. Apparently, there is a UK rapper whose voice print allegedly matches up with the guy who beheaded the American journalist James Foley this past week. They were supposedly able to figure this out in a matter of hours, and now they're on the hunt for this guy because he's like their number one suspect. Who knew they had rappers in England? But but in any case, um, th- th- are you aware that that type of technology exists? And, w- and in terms of this whole thing of the beheading, this comes right out of the book of Revelation. Uh, I uh-huh. mean, what are we looking at here? People being beheaded on YouTube. Um, it, it, this is unreal. Yeah, we, we, we really turned a corner. Um, there was some interesting posts that came across my desk right after the Foley execution. And, and you know, I looked at, I did not look at the entire video. I just, you know, I, I looked at the still photos. And I just I wasn't going to go and watch another decapitation. I just wasn't going to do it. Um, there's only so much stuff like that you can take. I know what they look like. I don't need to go through it. But apparently this just broke. Um, some are saying that the video is fake. Um, they're saying that, well, he wasn't executed on camera. He was executed off camera, blah, blah, blah. I mean, who knows at this point. So once hmm. again, everything is like turned upside down. And you don't know what to believe. You don't know what to look at. On the other hand, I did post, uh, this is several weeks ago, why it did not show decapitation. It showed mass killings. And I blogged about it. And that video, we have vetted as best as we can. It appears to be the real thing. Uh, people, uh, Iraqis are, are, are being, just like Germany, they're, they're in a flatbed truck with the rails. Uh, they've got their, um, got the plastic handcuffs on, you know, the, the, the hand ties. And uh, they're prodded out of the truck, uh, they run into a field, there's a mass grave there, they lay down in it, and a man walks by with an AK-47 and just starts popping people in the head, and that's real. The other one is when um, people are herded to a man by a river, there's a concrete dock and it's completely drenched in blood, and this one man is standing there at on the, on the concrete dock with a pistol in his hand as another man rushes the, the, the bound captive uh, to the water's edge. He raises the pistol, one shot to the back of the head, and they push him in the river, and that's the end of it. Um, this is the type of barbaric scenes that we're, Germany in World War II is famous for, but we must remember we've seen this from time to time. Certainly when Cambodia was overrun, three million people were slaughtered in pretty much the same way. When the uh, when the atrocities in Rwanda happened in the 90s, this, over a million people were slaughtered in the same type of way. Some people just hacked to death. So we see that evil um, has a face, and and man's humanity to his fellow man is knows no depth of, of depravity. I mean, it can just go on and on forever. But what's happening in in uh, in the Middle East, specifically with this with this new organization, ISIL, and the ISIL, by the way, stands for Islamic State of Syria. Uh, Iraq and the Levant. That's the original name. That was the where you can read his blog, which he blogs every day of the week, and lots of cool stuff here. L a Marzuli dot wordpress dot com, and also all of his speaking uh, schedule is there. And I've seen him in person. And man, if you love this guy on the radio, you got to go see him in person because it's like wow. <laughs> you, you've seen the movie, and then you see the guy in person, and it's it's just unreal uh, to go see him in person. Person. So check out his speaking schedule, and if you get a chance, if he's anywhere near where you are, uh, if you have to fly, uh, go see him. Uh, L.A., your new movie is out, Watchers 8, the DVD, and then the new book, Further Evidence of Close Encounters. And probably it would be easier for me to ask you what's not covered in these books and in and, and the video because there's so many topics covered. I watched the video today and my wife, whenever I watch her stuff, she always comes in the room and she says, what's he talking about? 
<laughs> she has no interest in it. She has no interest in anything else that I do except when I put your stuff on. She like all of a sudden gets away from like her Facebook and and her projects, and she wants. What's he talking about on that video? So the one thing I wanted to start with. You've been talking about this now for two or three years, I think, maybe longer. This phenomenon where people are seeing like colored orbs in the sky, and and this is. Uh, I mean, I'm hearing this from coast to coast AM. They're talking about this. They're talking about it on Whitley Strieber. This is all over the, the YouTube and the Internet. People aren't saying they're seeing saucers uh, in this. They're saying, like, colored uh, balls in the sky. And w what is that? And, and you've got that in your video. Is, is this a burgeoning phenomenon itself? Well, we, we think it is. Um, you know, the whole, the whole idea of, of the orbs, in fact, um, in, in our very first watchers, we showed some, some footage that came from a site where literally thousands of these orbs were in a field. I mean, literally thousands of them, um, very small, the size of a softball, and then up from there. Um, we also saw one of these orbs literally go back and, and go into someone's neck and not come out, the back of the neck. And, you know, is that demonic possession? Um, a, a colleague of ours um, posits that, these these orbs are in fact the disembodied spirits of of the demons. In other words, and I need to clarify something here. We know that the Nephilim were on the earth, and there are those scholars, for instance, um, Pember, uh, Clarence Larkin, just to name a few. But there are others, Dr. I. D. E. Thomas, my mentor, all all held to the position that the demons were the were the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim, which roamed the earth. Fallen angels are completely different than demons. Um, now, there's people that disagree with that. That's fine. But that, that's the position I hold. Fallen angelic beings are fallen angelic beings. Demons need something to inhabit. The, the, the proof text would be this. When, you know, God, in, in the book of Job, um, all the angels come and Satan's walking with them. Where have you been? God asks, well, I've been walking to and fro over the face of the earth. When Jesus is on the earth, and he's being tempted 40 days in the desert, Satan himself shows up and then takes him to a high place, offers him kingdoms of the world, takes him to the temple, right? Chains these stones. I mean, he's there. He's not inhabiting something. He's there. Contrast that with the, the demoniac in Gadara when Jesus, who are, and says to the man, who are you? And he says, legion, for we are many. It's a whole different deal. And then they beg him, hey, don't throw us into the, into the abyss. It's not our time yet, which is another three-hour conversation. Let us go into that herd of swine. So if it was if it's a fallen angel, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. So the, I, we think, we, we postulate that these orbs are, in fact, um, what these entities look like in, in the natural, for lack of a better word. They're like, they're like energy balls or... They're, that's what they are. Um, sometimes these close up to these photographs of these orbs, uh, you'll see faces in them. Now those are the smaller orbs. Then we get the the light orbs that, um, for instance, Dr. Lynn Katai, whose, whose interview is in further evidence. Now she was in Phoenix during the Phoenix Lights 1997, so it's been a while since that that happened. And of course that was a great controversial. Um, uh, uh, or, 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 or I should say it created a lot of controversy. Of course, the skeptics had a field day, and it's just, it's warthogs, you know, dropping flares, blah, blah, blah. Well, flares don't behave that way, and thousands of people saw this thing, and it was not any type of military maneuver, in my opinion, nor was it flares coming down from the sky. These, this was an enormous craft, which went from one end of the state to the other, turned around and came back up, seen by thousands of people, flew over Phoenix silently. We've got witness after witness after witness. Uh, Dr. Lynn Katai, um, I've interviewed her. That, that interview is, is in verbatim in the book. And that was huge, huge craft, over a mile wide, huge craft, seen by thousands of people. But prior to that, she saw these amber balls, these amber um, spheres, orbs, in front of her house. There were like three of them, according to her testimony, just hovering there. Are they... Are they intelligent? We don't know. Are they sort of like scout ships? We don't know. Um, then you get, for instance, Robert Salas, who we interviewed for Watchers 8, talks about 1967 Maelstrom Air Force Base, where there was 10 intercontinental ballistic missiles. Those are the ones with the nukes on them. Um, and he's got charge of them. And this, this, this very large 
30, 40 foot orb hovers over the base and then becomes a UFO. First it's an orb and then it becomes like a UFO. Well, how does that work? Well, of course, we don't know. So we're, we're in the real high strangeness here. Um, but the phenomenon and and uh, that segment of your video was just absolutely riveting because, uh, I don't know, it's hard to sometimes tell on a video, but that, that guy that you interviewed, he seemed so believable, and he was seeming very careful in what he was telling you. Then he followed up by saying he got a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. He put one in and got actually documentation of what happened to him when he was working underground in that uh, missile silo, and in fact... All of the missiles shut down simultaneously, which he said was like an impossibility. Yeah, that it was like impossibility. absolutely, it's an impossibility. I mean, look, what is it going to take to get people awake? How many people have to come forward with with ranks and stories like Robert Salas before people will start to believe? Uh, I'll tell you a story, and, I, and this was really interesting. Um, my my wife's car had some radiator problems, so I'm driving it down to the to our mechanic to get it fixed and looking at the needle the whole time hoping I can make it down there. Well, the, you know, the temperature gauge starts going up and I pull over. I call the tow truck. We couldn't make it down there. So we have AAA, so it was no big deal. I think it cost me like 15 bucks or something or whatever. So we towed the car down there. But on the way, I'm in with the tow truck driver. I'm in, I'm in the cab. What do you do? So, you know, we start talking about one thing and the other. And um, about halfway there, he looks at me and he goes, how long have you lived here? And I go, well, you know, almost 40 years now. And he goes, he kind of waits a little bit, and he goes, have you ever seen anything strange up there? And he points to the sky, and I start laughing. And I go, well, what do you mean? And you said, hey, my car's broken down, so they sent out a tow truck guy, and he's telling you he saw uh, uh, a UFO. I forget who it was. One of those famous, I, I think it was J.P. Morgan, decided to sell all of his stocks when, like, the shoe shine boy came running down to the stock exchange to buy stocks. When you hear the tow truck guy talking about UFOs, it, something's going on here. Well, there you go. And and the guy goes, um, he was coming up Pacific Coast Highway, right by the ocean, about one and one thirty in the morning, and there were three large craft you know, a couple hundred yards just above him, hovering there. Other people, other other um, witnesses were there, and they saw it. And um, he took a photograph of it, which I've seen. He said when he took his iPhone, the iPhone was hot. He almost dropped it. So something was going on with the iPhone. Um, he, two of them flew very quickly north and was out of sight. The other one went straight up. And he looked at me, and he said, and I said, well, you know, and I interviewed him, and I show that interview now <laughs> at the last prophecy conference, Prophecy of the News in uh, Pike Street, Colorado. But he looked at me and he said, you know, before I had this sighting, I, I didn't believe. I just thought it was all a bunch of hooey. Now I'm a believer. So I gave him um, one of my washers and uh, one of the books, because I always keep those in the car for exactly for that type of a of a guy or, you know, a woman that we meet. You never know. And it's, I want to have resources there just to hand people. But the point I'm trying to make here, Jim, is that, once you see one, this guy had an experience, close encounters of the first kind. I mean, he saw the craft. It wasn't a light in the sky. They were there, three of them. He made positive ID. So, I mean, he's, it's like, you know, now he's a believer. And that changes a person's paradigm drastically. And that's the whole point of what I keep trying to warn about. When the mile-wide craft shows up over Phoenix and just sits there in broad daylight or Paris or Washington or wherever, that's the game changer. That's going to change everything. And at that point, you know, well, the Vatican is already saying, and, and that's what the work of, of Chris Putman and, and Tom Horn's about in their uh, groundbreaking book, Exo Vaticana, um, talks about that the Vatican is actually sort of paving the way for an alien savior, according to Chris Putman. Yeah, and, and that's a book. I, I have that book sitting right here, and I haven't read it yet, but that's on my list of books to read. And there's people waiting to talk to you here. I've got a bunch more of my questions, but I probably won't get to all of these. But in any case, our, to our call-in number here toll-free is 877. 3176432 your chance to talk to LA Marzuli when he's on one of those super big shows you just can't ever get through so this is your chance folks if you ever want to be able to talk
talk to him directly, 877-317-6432. Or you can uh, drop us your question by email, jim at christianmoney.com. But we are going to go to the callers first. So, again, 877-317-6432. And our first caller is Wayne, and Wayne is in Florida. Wayne, say hello to L.A. Marzulli. Hello, Wayne. Are you there? There we got you now, Wayne. Yeah, can Are you, you with me? us? Yes, sir. Yeah, Go can ahead. Hear me? Go oh, ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Marzulli, it's a pleasure being able to talk to you. You're such a, uh, have uh, done so much research in, in your great lecture, and I kind of followed you. Thank uh, you. Appreciate it, Wayne. You have a book, uh, Psalms 83. Um, a lot of people probably aren't aware of that missing prophecy revealed. In there, you talk about Ezekiel, I believe it's Ezekiel 38, 39, it's somewhere in that. It might be even in the, your other book, America, because I'm, I'm trying to get into, uh, as a DVD, but uh, you have uh, information on all these nations that are going to be involved in that. So my two questions are, one, you're already touching on these uh, UFOs, and I just want to comment at the end on that. But on the beginning, I, uh, who is Gomer? When you, when you hear of all these nations that are going to be involved in the Ezekiel 38, 39 war, I've heard it said Gomer to be Germany, and then I've heard right. it said Gomer is a part of Turkey. Who is Gomer? Well, that's the thing. Um, if, if you, and, and that depends on who you talk to. Um, I've always believed that Gomer, Gomer actually is uh, certainly Germany, but it okay. also could be, you know, Meshach, Tubal, and uh, Togarma is Turkey. So Gomer is north of that, um, which is the present-day Germany. Um, yeah. It's very interesting, absolutely interesting. That's, of course, Ezekiel 38 prophecy. Yeah. And what we need to remember here is that um, radical Islam now has gone through that, in, that entire area. Uh, okay. and, and the demographics have drastically changed, specifically in Europe. Uh, I read an article, uh, I forget where I read it, but it was posted last week that the most popular uh, male name in, in Great Britain right now is Mohammed uh, instead of Winston. So that gives you an idea of, yeah. of how the demographics have changed. When yeah. we go to Denmark, um, the demographics there have changed. And what's interesting is enough, and um, I forget the author's name, he made a great case for it, um, and, it, and it did with great erudition. Uh, the abortion holocaust has killed a billion babies across the planet. A billion unborn children have been killed in their mother's wombs or taken from their mother's wombs, okay? Well, what's happening is, is in many European countries and, and places like Japan and America, uh, you're getting a negative birth rate. What I mean by that is there's no longer enough people to continue the culture. Right. You're not producing so enough not babies. in the culture, right? Uh, and, uh, Wayne, what, what was your second question real quickly before we have to move on? And, and it ties in what he's talking about right now uh, is that he's talking about UFOs and that. I've heard it said that the UFOs are uh, all found in either in the first or second heaven, but uh, uh, at some point in time when the astronauts get up beyond a certain point, they don't find UFOs. And the issue is it could be military, but I'm wondering, is it demons that are traveling to and fro? Uh, yes. In the, end the basic answer to that is yes. They are international yeah. beings and using these craft to flip, flip between the dimensions. Interdimensional is the key because I think this explains a lot of things when people say, well, the astronauts haven't seen anything, but do we really know that they haven't seen anything? I mean, if they had seen anything, would they tell us? I mean, that's a, a big question I have. But I've, I've got to hit you with this next one. Somebody's been following me on Facebook, so they're emailing me and they're saying, please get them to talk about Bigfoot because I did tell people <laughs> you were going to talk about that, and I was absolutely floored. My jaw hit the floor when your guest on the movie, the the video, Watchers 8, uh, proffered the theory that Bigfoot could be a hybrid. Yep. I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. Tell us your your theory uh, or your guest theory. I'm not sure if you completely embrace that about Bigfoot being a hybrid creature. Well, that, that's Ron Moorhead. Ron Moorhead's been with us um, both times that the film crew went down to Peru. Uh, Ron is an adventurer, but he's also an author. Um, he is... Uh, 
a fantastic book about Bigfoot, um, Sierra Sounds, in which he actually has a uh, audio recordings of these creatures, which have been vetted uh, by several universities and professors there, and they've looked at it and, and, and now come to the come to uh, the realization that it's a very highly complex language. He has encountered with these entities, these creatures. Um, he has seen a footprint, and he came on 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 uh, on camera and told us about that. Basically, uh, 27 inches, that's huge, and that would be probably a 15-footer that appeared and then disappeared. I've talked to other people who have seen them appear and disappear. I believe that they're interdimensional beings. I believe that they're hybrid beings. I believe, in fact, that they are Nephilim, and that's where Ron has now come down. He believes that there definitely could be a connection uh, between what we read about in Scripture with the Nephilim and Bigfoot. Wow, interesting. Now we've got another break coming up. And interestingly, his website where you can read his blog is lamarzuli.wordpress.com. And the name Marzuli is spelled M A R Z like in zebra, U L L I. And I'm looking here at his uh, upcoming speaking schedule. If I'm reading this right, he's going to be in Dumont, New Jersey in September. In October, he's going to be with Chuck Missler and Cordell. Lane, Idaho, and Idaho in November. There is a tri-state prophecy conference. This is all listed over at his website, lamarzuli.wordpress.com. The new book is further evidence of close encounters, and then the video is. Watchers 8, Cloak of Secrecy. And, Ella, I have to compliment you on the quality of these videos. At this point, this video I just watched could have been a TV show or a movie on the big screen. That's the production quality. Um, were you guys using the GoPro? Like, you had, like, shots where, like, the, yeah. plane, is, the plane is landing and you could see the, the landing gear opening up. I mean, this is, like, movie quality stuff you're doing here. Yeah, this is uh, all the work of my uh, good friend and co-producer of the Watcher series and director and editor. He wears a lot of hats, Richard Shaw. And uh, Richard and I have been doing uh, these for now four years. And uh, Watchers 8 will be the only film that we do this year. Richard's getting ready to go to Israel to shoot a very special film that he's been wanting to work on for actually before I ever knew him called on the Torah Codes. And, um, yeah, but the, Richard, we use GoPros. We use Canon cameras, 60Ds. He's got one. I have one. And we're always shooting. And uh, it's sort of guerrilla filmmaking at its best. But it all happens in, in post. And Richard does an amazing job at the editing helm. Yeah, the, the quality of this video. I, I know a lot of times Christian people, I know when we hear about a Christian video or a Christian movie, sometimes you think, yeah, yeah the content might be good and well-intentioned, but the quality is usually not there. This is just like uh, you're watching a movie. I mean, uh, it's it's right there with any Hollywood movie that, that you would watch. So, so get the video. It's called Watchers 8, Cloak of Secrecy. And we are going to take some more calls, and then I want to talk about uh, Mothman. But this is your last chance to call in 877-317-6432, 877-317-6432, or we'll start answering these email questions, jim at christianmoney.com, and a, a ton of email questions here. We'll get to those uh, if we don't get any more callers, 877-317-6432. Uh, Ellie Marzulli, let's talk about Mothman quickly here before we go back to uh, listener questions. For people that don't know the Mothman story, Story, give us sort of the Reader's Digest version of that. And I love your take on that from the book, how you see that, because it makes so much sense. It's like you're the guy that, that puts the final thought on these things, and finally it's like, okay, that now makes sense, because otherwise it's like, what is this flying uh, owl-like creature that people are? What could that possibly be? How do we explain that from a, from a Christian perspective? And then you hit it out of the ballpark with your view on that. Well, I, I certainly appreciate the kudos. I'm, I'm flattered. But basically, in 1966 into 1967, an entity which um, appeared in a little town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, uh, terrorized the inhabitants there for just about a year, climaxing with the collapse of the Silver Bridge. And when the bridge collapsed, there are some witnesses who believe, and I've got one photograph, it appears that Mothman was on the bridge, and others, other witnesses said he flew under the bridge, and shortly thereafter the bridge collapsed. Uh, scientists looked at it, and there was rivers that were bent. Okay, we get that. But, but you know, it's, it's very bizarre. It's extremely bizarre. But the bottom line is um, this, this entity um, first materialized 
um, at this abandoned military installation, and they used to manufacture TNT there. And it was like a lover's lane thing. People would go up there in the cars and horse around and park and, you know, do all the stuff that teenagers do. Well, these, these two couples went up there one night, and that's when they saw this thing, and they were absolutely terrified, absolutely terrified. And whatever this was, it flew over the car, and they were going between 90 and 100 miles an hour. That's how terrified they were. It chased them. It chased them. And wow. um, when they got to the town, um, you know, the men, in fact, one of the, the husband of one of the women never, still, to this day, he's alive. She, she passed away several years ago. Um, the, the man will, will still never talk about it. I interviewed a man, uh, Jonathan Gray, who... Um, <clears throat> had an encounter with this thing in his room and he later became a missionary in New Guinea. He was actually stu- Lawrence Grace rather, sorry. He was actually studying to become a uh, a missionary at the time. He was a born again spiritual Christian that heard about these sightings and, and realized that in his opinion it was uh, demonic in nature. It sounded like to him it sounded like a fallen angel. And he goes home one night and um very uneasy feeling the entire night. Has dinner with his wife, they go to bed 2.30 in the morning, the guy wakes up, looks over to the side, out the window, there's a car going by in the distance, street light, that whole deal. Then he looks to the, the front of his bed, and there is this entity standing right, at, right in front of the bed. And it was absolutely terrifying to him. And I asked him what was it like, and he said, first of all, he was paralyzed, he couldn't move, which is typical. And as he began to think the name of Jesus... The moment he thought the name of Jesus and began to say the blood of a lamb or the blood of Jesus, this entity began to dissipate and leave. I said, can you describe it to me? And he described it in one word, wickedness. And it, had, it was um, about seven feet tall. It had a, a cape on. Its head was sh- uh, shrunk down on its shoulders. Um, it had arms. It had like a, a one-piece like jumpsuit thing on. Very strange. And it had wings. Um and there you go. Uh, I don't want to see anything like that. I don't want an encounter like that. Who would? No one who saw this thing ever came away um, feeling good about it. Uh, the one woman who had an, who, went, who went very vocal, Linda, I want to say Scarberry, I think that's her last name. It's been a while since I've talked about Moth, and I need to hone up on it myself. But um, she, the encounter left her divorced and this long, slow decline before her demise several years ago. Uh, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's, it's the work of the fallen angel. They come to rob, they kill and destroy, which is exactly what this thing did. Uh, portals and gateways were opened. Um, in fact, my, my, when, I was, when I was studying it, this is years ago now, uh, when I was studying it, we actually found at an abandoned hotel or, or from one of the hotels this sort of like uh, a wooden, um, six-foot wooden carving of an ancient deity, a winged goddess, if you will, um, which was really bizarre. We took photos of that, and we, we talked about it. But I've never been there. We've, we've talked about going there, Richard and I, to actually do an exclusive on Point Pleasant and Mothman. It has been covered by so many people. And, of course, your guest next week is, is one of the authorities on it, having written two books, and I've read both of them, and interviewed him on my show. He's, he's just um, very up-to-date with, with all the latest uh, Mothman sighting stuff. Very good. And we've got time for one more question coming in from Chicago. It's an emailer, and it's a long email. They're asking here about giants, and do you agree with Steve Quayle? And they want you to comment on who the giants are, in your opinion, and your trip to Peru. All of that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, good luck for that. First of all, Steve Quayle is a great researcher, and yes, I agree like he does, that the, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Uh, the Nephilim are the product between fallen angels and the women of Earth. My mentor, Dr. I.D.E. Thomas, best-selling book, The Omega Conspiracy, uh, talked about that, talked about multiple incursions. Other people have said the same thing. That's what I uh, I fall you know, in line with that. And uh, basically, Peru is incredible. What we found there and some of the preliminary DNA evidence uh, taken by Lloyd Pye about four years ago now seems to indicate that the microchondral DNA um, has 
elements in it which do not match anything in the gene, in genome as we know it. So very interesting. More studying needs to be done. We've got nine samples. We are desperately trying to get them out of Peru. Um, we are looking for people to team up with us. We have an American archaeologist here. As of now, we are looking for Peruvian archaeologists um, that we can team up with. We have one, but it doesn't seem to be – we can't seem to get off the dime with this one particular gentleman. He's always so busy that nothing gets done. So, yeah, there's other sites in question, and um, – uh, the new book will be coming out in October, late October, early November, on the trail of a Nephilim 2, which will have some startling photographic evidence never seen before um, in, in the book. So I'll just sort of... Do you have anything on your blog? On uh, uh, do you have anything on your blog about the Point Doom underwater alien base, someone's asking? That's about 15 minutes from my house. I, I drive by it frequently. Uh, there's no way to vet that yet. Um, I'm aware of it. Again, this, this gentleman who saw the three UFOs, so there you go. That's like... That's all in the same the area. UFOs, that's five miles from, from the site. If that. Very good. L.A. Marzulli, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you, Jim. You're a great it. guest, and uh, I want to give everybody the website again, lamarzulli.wordpress.com. Joy, producer Joy, go ahead and put a link, please, on my Twitter feed. I'm at James L. Paris to L.A.'s blog, lamarzulli.wordpress.com. Jim Paris here, as always, to help you make the most of God's money. We'll talk to you next